Okay. So, um, just up this, uh, this for whatever reason, it's, it's still not showing up. That's sharing the entire desktop, isn't it? Yes. Yes, that's right. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, okay, so, um, today we're going to, uh, go through, uh, two topics, I'm hoping. The first is going to be building a hierarchical metapopulation model. We're going to um, take advantage of any logic's ability to uh, embed um, embed different layers of, um, of, of logic, of, of uh, behavior and dynamics at several different levels of a, of a model. Um, so we're going to have a nested hierarchy of, um, of agents in this case. Um, which are going to exhibit uh, different behavior at different levels, and we're going to have some uh, behavior going on at the global level as well. So um, frequently there's a need, the dis this discussion, the motivation for this discussion lies in the fact that we frequently have a need for hierarchies, of, uh, to represent hierarchies of environments and actors. So these include uh, representing, for example, regions, municipalities, neighborhoods, individuals, uh, at the public le health level, at the biological level, it might include um, an entire organism, organ systems, organs within those uh, organ systems, uh, down to the levels of cells and, and components of cells. And uh, it's widely recognized at a statistical level um, that uh, understanding the uh, behavior at these different levels can be important for gaining insight into um, outcomes at these different levels. So, for example, there's uh, multi-level modeling approaches such, such as hierarchical linear modeling, uh, mixed model, uh, uh, mixed uh, mixed method models that um, that try to capture the um, the effects of hierarchy, different levels of the hierarchy on uh, the behavior, say, of individuals within that hierarchy. Frequently, these hierarchies are also associated with their own structural and dynamic complexities, which uh, to which, for whose understanding, we'll we'll turn to dynamic modeling. So, um, an example of structural and dynamic complexities um, we'll look at here is a situation where municipalities are arranged in transportation networks, uh, where those networks may consist of road, rail, air connections, etc., and people within a given municipality are largely connected with each other, but they may move between municipalities. So they may move between these sort of nested contexts. Um, now, we've been working on introducing the past number of lectures a variety of, of uh, elements, elements of the any logic vocabularies, as I've referred to them, um, by which we build up a model. Those elements include things like state charts, they include things like uh, stock and flow um, elements, they include things like events, um, representation of space, etc. cetera. Um, and typically, we have placed these items at certain fixed positions within a model. So for example, the representation of space, of agents uh, spread out over some space was typically placed in main. Um, we had state charts typically placed at an agent level. Um, stocks and flows, uh, we didn't really talk about yet in an agent-based context, um, but we might think of them, I think I've referred to them as driving agent behavior, for example. It turns out that while these are common places to put these sort of uh, behavior elements, they're not required. So any logic affords us quite a lot of flexibility in where we place these agents. So though, for example, in principle, you could place the state chart within main. State chart in main might capture, for example, progression of seasons. Maybe it's seasons as we know it, spring, summer, winter, fall. Maybe it's, it's seasons of biological relevance to the populations of interest, such as uh, rut, pre-rut, fawning season, et cetera, for deer or other ungulates. Um, now, uh, because of this flexibility that, it, that any logic affords, we can create structural hierarchies within any logic that parallel hierarchies in the world. This is an important point. The fact that within our agent-based model, we can represent hierarchies of actors, say, um, country, 
region, province, and city, and neighborhood, and individual. Um, we can place those things, but the, the nesting of them within the model reflects the nesting within the world itself. That's a deep point. It turns out that that, that relationship is not there for example, if you build an aggregate model where you use disaggregation, creating of separate stocks to represent, say, different neighborhoods um, within a city, um, you can compute statistics at the city level, at the neighborhood level, at the individual level, but all those variables are kind of at the same level of the stock and flow diagram. There's no nesting of that stock and flow diagram that reflects the nesting in the world. And within an agent-based context, we do have this kind of nesting in our model mirroring the nesting in the world. So that's important. Um, so I'm just coming back to your remote folks. Are, are, you, are you folks seeing the screen right now? Uh, I believe you asked me if we were seeing the screen, and no, we are not, actually. Okay. I'm just going to rejoin as a moderator okay. and see if that makes sense. Okay. Okay. I am, um, yeah. Uh, I, I've just stopped screen sharing there, and I'm. Yeah, um, I'm. I'm now. Um, I'm now switching over to share that particular window, uh, sort of out of, out of desperation. Um, okay, so um, I'm switching to sharing the PowerPoint window in partic particular. There we go. Um, okay. Okay. Um, and now we are seeing just the gray screen. Okay. Uh, well, then, then it sounds like that's not works. So, so I'm gonna. Uh, sure. Uh, sh sure, sure. Uh, give moderator privileges. Okay. Um, you're now a moderator, uh, Tyson. Um, I'm gonna try sharing the entire desktop again. Uh, okay. So now you're s able to see it. So um, what I'd like you to load in is uh, a model which I've provided to you or which we've built up, pre uh, built up previously called Minimalist Network ABM Model. Um, now, when you load this, I would suggest saving it as hierarchical city population model, okay? Um, because we're going we're gonna to build this in a hierarchical fashion so that we have uh, agents within cities. And um, I don't want you to overwrite the original model. So, like you to load it in and then save it as hierarchical city population model, okay? Um, and within this context, um, we're going to have main containing a network of cities and then a city containing a population of persons. Uh, so to do this, um, we're gonna start with uh, a model where we simply have um, main and, and person and we have uh, the simulation. Um, okay, uh, can you see the screen now? Yeah, yes, we can see it, and your audio is cleared up. Okay, the, uh, okay. Good, uh, good. Okay, so um, that's telling. Uh, so uh, what I'd like you to first do is to copy the person class. This is a matter of convenience. Um, we're going to do this so that um, we can avoid having to sort of reconstruct it from scratch. So I'd like you to right click on person and uh, do uh, copy. And then I'd like you to click on the, um, on the name of the whole project and do a paste. So what you should get from this is two copies of person, one called person, one called person one, okay. Um, person one will, uh, be another agent class as indicated by its designation here, okay? Um, again, you're welcome to, to build it up from the start. And then following that, I'd like you to click on person one and rename it C, okay? Um, now, uh, this is uh, making use of um, the pre-existing model and I will see for those who are local, um, uh, actually it looks like it will work even for those who are remote, I will see if I can um, follow this along uh, on within any logic as well. So um, 
I'd like you to rename that person one as city. And then I'd like you to open, uh, open main. And um, I'd like you, for the population within Maine, um, to delete it. And we're going to drag in, we're going to create a population of city. So let me ask this, within any logic, um, how do we create a population? Who can remember that? How do we create a population, for example, within the Maine class? What do we, what do, we do to create that population? Surely someone remembers. Yeah, we drag drag in the agent class associated with that that population. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna going to uh, load this in. Um, so I'm starting off with the model. So you're going to essentially um, drag it in there, and uh, you're going to have something called city as a result. And what I'd like you to do is to set that, this is now a population, you should name it cities, and set it to have the environment, environment, and replication of 10. Okay. Um, so we're going to have a replication of that, um, of that population. We're going to have 10 elements within that population. Um, Okay, uh, let's see. Um, okay, that's, that's fine. So in short, we've now, we've deleted the original population, we've dragged in the city to there, we've named it cities, giving, giving it uh, a reference to the environment and given it a replication size of, of 10. Okay. Um, And now what I'd like you to do is go to the environment and set it to be a distance space connection with connection range of 250. And as a, as a reminder here, to do that, you're going to have to go to environment and set the, you can use the advanced tab of environment to go choose uh, distance based connection. So that's a, a, a network based connection um, that's, that's based on distance. Mm -hmm. so, yes? Okay, so sure, I, I'm going to actually do this um, right now uh, in front of you. So uh, what I'm going to do is to save this model as um, uh, a separate hierarchical population model. Okay, um, and uh, the short answer is what you're going to do is you're going to drag city over there to create the population, and then you're going to rename it as cities. By through its properties here. Okay, so um, trying this again. Okay, and this will be hierarchical city population model. Um, okay. So what I'm what I'm doing here is I first. Um, copy person, copy, and then I paste this, paste. Again, that's purely a matter of convenience just because I didn't want to have to go through and, and redefine it as an agent. I'm deleting the original population. I am renaming person one to be uh, city, and then I'm dragging it in this environment, and I'm renaming it as cities. and within this general area here, I'm referring to the environment as environment, and I'm setting it to be replicated with an initial number of objects of, of 10, okay? Um, so uh, I think we'll want to um, um, want to make sure that uh, this is updated, okay. Okay, now, Again, for the advanced tab associated with the environment, I'd like you to set it to be a distance-based connection uh, associated with 250, um, uh, 250 distance, okay? Um, so what does that mean? What does it mean that we have 250 there? It means what? A given 
pair of cities will be connected if and only if their distance is uh, 250 units or less. Okay, so um, it's exactly equal to 250. I'd have to think what it does, but in any case, um, 250. Okay, so now what I'd like you to do is double click on, on city, and um, I'd like here, when, when we open up city, what we should see is something like this. We have this kind of visual representation, and we're going to embed a population of people within city, population of person. How are we going to do that? Using your, the lessons you've learned elsewhere and translating to this context, how do we embed a population of person into the city? Anyone want to hazard a guess? Yeah, just drag it in. So that's all you do to create the population. You just drag it in. And we can name this uh, city population. Okay, So name it city population. Uh, so now we have a city population. I'd like, I'd like you to set it to be replicated. And I'd like you to set it to an initial number of objects given by a draw from a random dis uh, uniform distribution. A uniform distribution that's discrete, meaning that it's, it's uh, only integer numbers. And it's uh, between, I think I said 10 and 200. Okay, uh, ten and whoop, ten and two hundred. Okay, so so what that means is that each city has a given population. This population will be set up front by drawing from this uniform distribution, uh, uniform discrete distribution between uh, in the range of, of zero to two hundred. Okay, um, now. In order for this to display properly, we're going to need to associate those, those individuals, that population, in fact, with an environment. So to do that, we're going to have to add an environment here at this level. So uh, we're going to have to go up to um, the top of the palette and add an environment. And we should call it city environment, OK? City environment. Now, for the city environment, what I'd like us to do is to uh, impose some space associated with it. So you'll notice that um, this is a continuous 2D space right now. I'd like to actually set its height and width to be 75. Okay, um, and I'd like I'd like to set this to be a scale-free network. Okay. Um, so uh, rather than having a distance-based network, it, it should be scale-free. Oh, um, should be a scale-free network. And you can leave the parameters uh, by default. And we're going to need to set the population so that its environment is city environment. Okay. Um, so uh, what did I just do? Well, the first thing we did is we dragged in person into this, this, this city agent. This is the first time we've done that. Embedded one set of agents within a different set of agents. We dragged in person to city so that we have a population of people within this each city agent. And we set that population to be, to be associated with the environment, city environment, an initial number of objects is given by a draw from a uniform discrete distribution between 10 and 200. And uh, we set the city environment, again, to have a scale-free network associated with it and to have a width and height of 75, okay? Because we want that city to be more bounded in its, its appearance. So I'd like you to run the model now, um, and you should see something like... Uh, like a uh, multi-scale network. So there should be should be extra structure. So can anyone interpret what's going on here? What are we seeing? Parse this picture for, for me. Anyone parse 
reverse it for me? Can you can you remote folks still see the screen? There's no yellow. Okay, there's no yellow band around it at all, but somehow it's magically working. Um, when there is a yellow band, sometimes it doesn't work. When there's no yellow band, it, sometimes it's still working. Um, okay. Um, so so what are we seeing here? Okay, good. And so these clusters are what? They're each cluster is a city, and this group of people within it. What makes it confusing is that we have these kind of uh, two interpretations. So what does a circle mean here? Okay, so this is an agent. What's that? This is an agent too. It's what sort of agent? It's a, it's a city's representation, this, this one up here. So, <coughs> So we, we want to we generalize this sum, and we've gotten somewhere. I'd like to change the relative size for city. So double click on city, open up city, and uh, I think what we should do is use a larger, larger um, size of oval. So I'd like you to, to try to um, take an oval, drag it down till it just about fills out this, this kind of area to kind of two of these big squares out there. So I'm going to do it in front of you. Here's the city. We double click on city and we take this this element here and we drag it down. We should see that. But you know, I'm going to I'm going to live a bit dangerously here. I know this is 75 wide and high. So why don't I just make it Why don't I delete that? And I'm going to depart from script here. And I'm going to drag a rectangle here of width and height 75, OK? Um, so uh, each of these squares is 10. So this will be of width and height about 80, OK? Um, something, something along those lines. Um, uh, it's a little bit, little bit off. Um, but uh, yes. Um, okay, I'm, I'm making it like this. I'll, uh, fine, I'll drag it out to here. Two of the big uh, grid squares. Okay, now let's run it. And uh, what should we what should we see? Okay, um, well, that's kind of nice, but um, this thing is has got some things peeking around the borders here. And second of all, they're behind it. So how are we going to make them not behind it? By the way, what's this residual circle here still? What's it, what's this residual circle doing here? Where'd that come from? I thought I just deleted the circle to replace it with a square. Why is there a residual circle? Okay, so that's a representation visually of a person. And why is that representation put down here? It's because we have a population of people. And what that shows is in fact relative to what Point. That shows the point relative to which we display the people. So that's the, that defines the origin of the, of the uh, coordinate system for people's display within the city. So if a person is at location 1010 within the city, they, they'll be displayed at 1010 relative to the center of that circle. So that's the origin there. Um, just to sort of accommodate the edges of circles peeking out and so on, I'm just going to drag this out a little bit um, here. And now, now we can run it. And we'll see that we've covered up the, the kind of things uh, peeking out from the sides. That's all well and good. Um, but we still have this issue of, of the uh, thing appearing behind them. So to deal with this, what you have to do is right click on this square and do send to back. So you do order send to back. Okay? And it will display it behind the things imposed upon it. Um, so that's uh, that's all well and good. Let's um, we've just sent it to back and now if we display this, what we'll see is is the sort of network of connections coming in coming in to each uh, to each city. 
Um, okay, they're all coming into sort of the origin of the city. Suppose we wanted to make these long distance connections fatter and thicker. Where would we go do it? Describe to me where we'd go to, to do something like that. Navigating around this package is, is a lot of the battle. So where would we go to change the appearance of the connections between between um, cities? Would we go to Maine? Portland, Bangor, Brunswick? Where would we go? Okay, so we go, go to city, in fact we're in city, and where would we go within city? In fact, what we need to do is we need to adjust the line. There's actually a hidden, hidden line here still, um, which is behind the scenes here, associated with the presentation. And it's kind of hard to get at, so my suggestion would be to do so through this environment here. Go from city down to presentation and line. And then we can set the properties associated with the line. I, I think to do this, we would, well, we could do it right here, actually, line width. We could set it to be a width of, say, 10 um, instead. And then it will become a big, thick, thick line. And we can, we can display it now. And there we go. OK. So now we have. Uh, we have a, a connection, a set of road connections that are, are more obvious. Okay, so fair enough. Um, so now we have some agents within cities, within the overall environment. And if we go up here and we look at the navigation window, what do we see? Please parse this for me. So I'm clicking on the navigation window. What, what do we see here? Well, we see a hierarchy mimicking the hierarchy of, of the, the model, so of active objects. Main is an active object. Each of the agent classes is, is an active object class. So we have cities within main, city populations within cities. Okay. Um, so, so we can choose among cities and then populations within it. So if we go to city zero, um, what we'll find is only that is displayed. And you'll notice that within city zero, we have a population of size 20, zero through 19. And you know, here's the information on it. Whoa, um, let, me, let me go up here. Um, here's the information on who lives in that city right now. And uh, here's information in the local environment. This is a depiction of where it's located, at where it's located. And of course, we, can, um, we could cycle between cities here. So that gives us a sense where each city is. Now, within each city, we can go and inspect the population members by going down another level of the hierarchy. So this is the different individuals within the population, each of whom is, um, is presented here. Um, so uh, in short, we can, we can browse elements at the different levels through this hierarchy and use this um, this is this navigation tool to sort of uh, browse among those different levels of the hierarchy. This is our hierarchical model. Um, right now, it's associated with singularly unimpressive dynamics. There's really not much happening uh, within this model. It's nothing of visible uh, substance. Um, so um, let, let's refine this a bit more. Um, First of all, you'll notice that uh, if we if we run this thing right now, um, so if, if we if we ran it, you'll notice that the um, that those lines are going to the upper left of these cities. If we wanted them to come to the center of the city, again we have to deal with this origin issue. We need this line here to be relative to the uh, excuse me, uh, this line here. To be relative to the, to to come into the to the middle point of the city. So, um, we're we're gonna we're gonna move it to the midpoint of the city. I needed to do that. I needed to sort of uh, 
highlight it via this and I kind of dragged it over in a clumsy fashion. Uh, so if I go run this thing now, um, what we'll see is um, now they're coming into the midpoints of the, of the cities. Because I placed that thing relative to the point where I, you know, I want its endpoint to be. <coughs> Remember, these lines are connected to other cities by reasoning we, we defined previously. What was that reasoning? Can anyone remember? Okay, they're only connected with a certain distance. But why are these lines, how do these lines magically know, automagically know how to go to the other cities? This is one of the reasons I copied the person agent, by the way. So we wouldn't have to go through that exercise again. How do these lines automatically go to these other agents, these other cities? Where's the logic for that? Remind me, folks. What's sorry? Right? It's it's actually not in the environment. What is it that tells this line how far over it needs to go in x and how far over it needs to go in y? In short, it's it's delta x, delta y. It's dx, dy. What is it that tells it how far to go over? Where's that logic located? It's in the line itself. Yeah. So if we go to look at that line, if we select that line, we go to dynamic, we'll see some properties there. I'll make this <laughs> full screen. Where did these properties come from? You should see something like this. Where did these properties come from? I mean, I'm engaged in encouraging spiral learning right now. Where did these come from? Who typed these in? Ladies and gentlemen, you typed them in um, when the world was still young. Um, uh, so, so you put these things in here. Let's rehearse what they mean. What is replication here? Create the number of instances of that object. Of that line. Yeah, so what's dx here? Why, are, wh why is this the rule for dx? The delta x of the line. It's determining the difference in what between the, the neighbor and ourselves. It's determining the difference in x-coordinate. X this dot get connected agent of index dot get x, what is that referring to? Where did this index automatically come from? Well, if we click on it, we see a little light bulb. And it says use index as index of the replicated line. So what does that mean? What is this dot get connected index agent of index dot get x? What does that really mean? It's saying what? Good. So for a given line, it's going to be determining what the x is. And that line is associated with an index, right? That line is associated with a certain index, the index of its replicated line. A given agent here, a given city in this case, could be a person um, in other cases. A given, given agent may have many lines, hence this whole replication thing up top. So maybe it has three lines associated with it. Each of those lines, for each of those lines, it's going to need to determine the dx, right? how far over that line goes. It's going to need to determine the dy. So to determine the dx for that line, which is going to be associated with an index called index, it's going to be any logic that takes care of us providing with the index that says, hey, hey you, figure out the dx for the line numbered index, 0, 1, or 2, for three lines. And, and it says, yes, sir. Um, I'm going to figure out this dot get connected agent of index. So that figures out, okay, for this agent, who's, it says, hey, okay, if, if you're telling me to figure out my, my, uh, my uh, dx, and I'm, I'm line index, say index is one, then I say, hey, agent, get me whoever's connected to you, um, uh, the, the first person connected to you, you know, the, 
where this is considered index zero base. So zero to first or second. So who's the first person? It gives me back a reference to them and I get the get x value from that and I subtract off my get x value. And that determines the get x and similarly for get y. So index here is provided to me so I can do my job of figuring out for this particular line associated with this agent how far over I have to go. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. So in time immemorial, you folks wrote that code. And that's what a line allows these lines to automatically connect. And when we copied person at the beginning of this, one of the reasons I did that was so that code would be copied with it. So we didn't have to go through and, and redefine that code. Because ladies and gentlemen, that code exists also at the level of person, right? So if we go up to person, we will find that its line two knows about how many replications it requires and it asks about who its connected agents are. But for a person, the connected agents for that person will be what? Connected agents for a person will be other other persons. Good. Connected agents for a city will be cities. Yeah. And hence, hence it doesn't get them mixed up, right? Um, persons are connected with persons. Why are persons connected with persons? Well, where do person populations get defined? They get defined where? Where are the person populations here defined? They're defined in the city. And who takes care? Who takes care of managing the structure of networks, ladies and gentlemen? What, what element of the any logic vocabulary is used for, for connecting people up, for determining a distance-based connection, determining a scale-free connection? What, what, um, what object, what type of, of um, uh, um, element has that responsibility within any logic. It is the environment, right? Um, it's the fact we have people are connected up according to their environment. That's why their environment is set by the city environment. And the city environment is responsible for connecting them in a scale-free network. So it connects people to people within that city. Mm -hmm. um, and meanwhile, the environment who is it that dictates where, where, um, to what cities are connected? Who, who dictates what cities are connected up and where they're placed? Who is it that dictates that? It is the, it is an environment that does. And where does that environment live? Where does the environment that dictates where cities are connected live? In Maine. In Maine. That's right. So if we go up to Maine, we go up Maine and uh, we go look at the environment there. What we see is, you know, there it's, it's uh, using a distance based connection. And the population of cities indeed refers to the environment, uh, that environment, the global environment. Okay. So, so cities are connected to cities because the, city po the population of cities requests that this environment handle connecting itself up, handles laying out those cities. And people are connected with people because they delegate their, their connections to an environment, and that environment lives in each and every city. And each new city has a copy of that environment, therefore a new environment associated with that particular subpopulation. Okay, so any questions on the basics of this model before we tweak it a little bit more? Hmm? Hmm? No? Okay. Um, a hierarchical model. Um, okay. Um, yeah, okay. Well, so let's, let's get us... Um, we're going to start breaking out today from a 
method specific set of methods to more general um, sets of things that, that apply across the three different major methods of modeling that we're dealing with here, agent-based modeling, system dynamics modeling, and discrete event modeling. And one of those items is going to be uh, statistics. Um, so uh, what we're going to do here is to define some statistics over the population. If we look right now at person, um, I think actually uh, right now this has no um, uh, no uh, parameters associated with it. At least mine doesn't. So I'm going to add some parameters in. So I'm going to add in a parameter called income, and I'm going to add in a parameter called um, in fact did I uh, yeah so um, so I added in a parameter called income to population to person. So I double click person and I dragged in a parameter called income, okay? Um, so uh, now I'm going to add a, uh, a statistic at the, uh, at the city level which is going to compute the, um, the population of that city as well as another statistic which will be the mean income of that city. So I'm going to go up to city and within city I am going to go to this population where it says city population. We're going to see how we can add a statistic. So you'll notice we've never done this before within this class, but you'll notice within the population there's a tab uh, for the properties of that population. There's a tab saying statistics, and we're going to do add a statistic, and I'm going to ha first have city population, and it's just going to count up true the number of people in that population. Okay, um, so we're going to have a statistic associated with this city that's going to be its total number of people. So we can get that information from it. We're going to add a statistic, however, and we're going to further define a statistic that's going to be um, uh, mean mean income. Okay, and this is going to be an average of the incomes for the um, subpopulation. So here the, the expression here is, is going to need to depend on, this is going to take an average over some expression. And in order for us to, to within that expression, refer to the agent, because this is typically going to be an average over properties of agents, we have to use this word item. And item is going to refer to the embedded object, which is the agent here. So within the city, we can do item.income, that, that was that parameter I just added. And so here we would compute up statistics on that, that uh, population, its mean income. And the condition is going to be true here. This is the condition under which count a given, a given item over which we're taking the average. So what did I do here? Let's rehearse this quickly. I went to person, I dragged in a parameter called income, and it's, it's a double. It's a double precision value. I then went to city. I went to the city population. And I went to statistics. And I added the statistics tab. And I added two statistics. The first is called city population. And I think I'll just make it called city population, not city population stat. It's a count. And it has condition true. The second is called mean income. It's an average of item.income. Item referring here to the, so this is going to iterate over, it's going to take the average of this expression over each person in the population. Persons here, because we're dealing with the city population. For each person, it's going to determine their income, and it's going to then take the average over that, over all the different ones. So it's going to iterate over with item specifying for, for each particular person in turn. And the condition is true because we're counting all of them. So if we run this model now, uh, oh, excuse me, we have to do one further thing. Excuse me. So you'll notice now that we added a parameter within person, if we go to general within um, the properties of the population, or if we go to the parameters tab, either one, there'll be a space for income. Hmm? There'll be a space for the income. And what does this mean? We, we've actually seen this before. What, is that, what does that field mean here? 
we have the city population that says parameters. What does this field allow us to specify? Anyone? Sounded like R2D2 was trying to answer my question. But what does that field specify? Yeah, it's the value of the income for the for each member of the city population. So it's going to evaluate this expression, whatever we put there for each member of that population. So let's um, let's put a um, let's put a, a log normal distribution there. Um, so um, maybe we'll uh, have a log normal distribution with. Uh, with uh, log uh, log mean being say four and log standard deviation being also uh, I'll say being three something like that. So here we we're drawing the income of a given person that population from from a log normal distribution with a log mean of four log standard deviation of three. And if we run this, what we should see is something along these lines. Um, oh, something, OK, log normal. Excuse me. Um, I have to specify a third parameter. Um, OK, so I think that, that may be a, um, gosh, uh, I'm, I'm going to have to figure out uh, what that third parameter is. Let's go look it up. Um, it may be a minimum or something along those lines. Um, so let's look up log normal, log normal. OK, here we go. Um, OK, um, OK, min. Yeah, it's a minimum. Well, our minimum here is 0. Um, but that's enforced automatically because it's log. Uh, it's it, it's going to be um, the exponential of that uh, in terms of the actual population. OK, so I'm running this. I'm going to dive down to uh, cities, and uh, I can go click on city population here. Whoa, um, city population, and what we'll see is the mean income is nine hundred two dollars. Um, but if we go down to the city population here, each member of it, we'll see that these individuals um, vary quite a lot in terms of their income. Um, this this individual is um, has a very limited means associated with them, uh, whereas some are quite large. This one is in the hundreds. Some are um, this one indeed is very small. Um, so we see a, a fair degree of variation. Okay. Um, so uh, what we've just done is is two things. We've number one added added a uh, a bit of heterogeneity to this population. Um, in the form of, of parameters. Number two, we have created <coughs> statistics that compute things over this heterogeneity in the context of this heterogeneous population, which include a, a population count and a mean income associated with that. So these are the statistics which are printed here associated with this population. Those are defined, you'll recall, under the statistics of this population. And we just needed to specify, in this case, the, the, the expression that needs to be averaged over the population or the, the expression which, uh, for membership, that's to be counted for the city population. Okay? So here's, a, here's an example of statistics and an example of uh, of how we can set a subpopulation's characteristics. Let's um, let's go further refine this by having some characteristics on a city basis. So we might, for example, have a city income mu and a city income city income uh, uh, sigma. And those are going to be uh, characteristics for that city. So these will be uh, parameters of the city. And we're going to set now the city population to have a log normal distribution whose first parameters could be city income mu 
and whose second parameter will be city income sigma. So what have I just done here? By adding these two populations at the city level, the two parameters at the city level, now I've preferred within the city population, the parameters here are set to log normal. From so what, what am I doing? What is this, well, again, what does this, this, the expression here mean? We have city population having as parameters this for the income parameter. What is this doing? It is <coughs> drawing a value for what? How many times is this executed? For each person, it's going to determine their income by this expression. It's going to run this expression over and over again. And it's using here parameters which are specific to the city income mu is specific to the city. City income sigma is specific to the city. So now we're going to have each city have different characteristics in terms of its distribution of incomes. Okay? So let's, so now we have these parameters for city. So let me ask this. Parameters for person. The parameters for a person, where are those specified? Where are those set? Where are those given? Where is the value of the parameters for a person given within this model? This is not a trick question. Yeah, it's given in the city. It's given right here. It's given associated with the population within the city. Because that's where persons live, in that population. That's the thing which is responsible for creating those persons within the city. Is this population, this population here. And so it needs to specify the assumptions for each of those people, in this case, the income. And that's why we're specifying it right here, in front of your very eyes. We're specifying what expression to use to determine the income for a given person. And again, that is set by the point where those people are created. And the point of creation for those people is associated with the city population. So we have to specify their, the assumptions for those persons here. So now, let me turn that around and ask you, here we have parameters for the city. City income mu, city income sigma. Where will the values of that be specified? By the same principle. It'll be in y in main. That's correct, y in main. Sorry? Yeah. Yeah, so, so the city population defined in, so, so the population of cities, I should say, is defined in Maine, right? And so that's the point of creation of the cities. And so we're going to specify its characteristics there. Incidentally, if cities were created elsewhere on the fly dynamically, they were being founded as the model ran, we'd also have to specify it there. People were being added to the city through immigration or through births or what have you. We'd have to specify the, the assumptions about them, their parameters at that point as well. So it really is kind of this point of creation. Okay, so let's go up to Maine. Let's go, let's go down Maine. That's how it would be said. Um, uh, so let's go down Maine, and here's the population of cities. And lo and behold, if we go to parameters tab, or you can do it through general, now we have city income mu and city income sigma. Okay. So we can draw our values for the parameters for the city. In this case, kind of the characteristic income levels for that city, we can draw them here. So we could draw, for example, for city income, maybe this is from a uniform distribution. I don't know. Um, it's, it's almost certainly not going to be uniform. But you know, we could draw that from um, a uniform distribution between you know, um, uh, 3 and, and 10. Um, and 10 is a bit high, 3 and 8. Um, and we could 
draw the city income sigma between um, uh, you know three and six or something like that. Um, okay, so when a given city is created, it's going to <coughs> evaluate these expressions, uniform 3.8 to determine its income U, and uniform 3.6 determines income sigma. Okay, it will then get created, and then it will create its population. So if we were to run this thing now, what we should see is, is what? How will it differ now from what it was before? Well, the cities will have different types of of uh, characteristics and unfortunately it's dragged behind here. I could drag this around but I'll drag it around as a whole. I'm going to go disentangle those things so I can see them better. So I'm going to go up to city and I'm going to sort of drag its parameters out of the way of um, so if I got a city here I'm going to drag these things out of the visual area. So to do that using a trick that XJ Tech uses a lot I'll drag them over here to the left. Okay. I just selected them, I dragged them to the left. And now they're at least away from the visible area that's going to be used uh, to, display the, um, to display the city. Okay, so I'm going to go run this again. Okay, so run it again. And here we go. And now let's go, go look at each city. Okay, so I could drag over here. City income U, 6.6. .6. City income sigma, 4.3. Relatively, a relatively wealthy city, if you consider the range between three and eight, and one that has a, uh, a fairly large uh, disparity. This might be something like the US. And so I, I um, go down here and what we see is incomes of particular individuals within that city. And we'll see that some individuals are very, very wealthy. Um, that's Mitt Romney maybe um, and uh, some individuals are, are poor um, um, members of the 95% um, particularly this one here um, okay so 99% uh, sorry um, okay so um, here we we go up and again we'll see different cities have different characteristics this city uh, is, is again a little bit wealthier this city is poorer um, but it has a large disparity. Um, so we can go down and, and explore in that city and we'll find that most of the incomes are, are, um, are uh, probably s uh, smaller but there's significant variations, yes. Um, and again, we have statistics within each city that we entered before, statistics on the count of people and the mean incomes in those cities, okay? Um, wow. So there's a city with a mean income of, of $3.5 million. Um, that's like West Palm Beach or something. Um, okay. Uh, but unfortunately, it's probably, yeah, it's, it's highly disparate. Um, so now we have sort of characteristics. Yeah, and this is, this is someone with 70, $79 million. Um, well, he doesn't have billions like Romney. Um, but uh, it's quite a lot. Okay, so um, so what we've done is we've introduced heterogeneity in the level of cities, and the city will have sort of a characteristic population distribution, and then that's shared to some degree by individuals within the city. So we've seen um, heterogeneity in this context. In traditional multi-level modeling, um, such as would be done with a mixed effects model or with um, hierarchical linear modeling, structural equation modeling. Often these are referring to, to uh, things which have some overlap methodologically, um, would pick up that sort of um, variability. That there's variability at the level of the city and then there's variability at the level of a person. And you want to parse out the contributions of each of those levels. It goes without saying that this uh, approach to hierarchical structuring could be applied all the way down. So you could have three levels, four levels, five levels of organization in this way with different um, characteristic structure at each level. In our closing minutes here, what I'd like to do is to emphasize um, uh, the possibility of uh, 
of introducing dynamics at each of these different levels. Um, so for example, um, we might have, um, well, okay, I was going to have movement, um, movement between these places. Um, it, may, uh, it may be worth uh, just adding some dynamics uh, within this. So, um, so for example, what we could do is within a person, let's add in some very simple dynamics associated with states and state transitions. So we can drag in at the level of person a state chart entry point. Um, and for some reason, this is uh, taking for a bit of time to, to update here. Um, but we could uh, create a state chart of this sort. Um, so we could have something infected recovered in sort of a classic way. And, and then uh, we could, uh, so, so if we drag these in, um, oop, come on. Um, so susceptible. And this would be, um, misspell that, uh, infective, infective, and recovered. And we could draw transitions between these. Okay. Uh, and, uh, for this um, transition from infective to recovered, perhaps we'd have this based on a certain um, certain rate, or we could have it based on a timeout. Um, I'll make it based on a timeout with a timeout of, say, 10 time units. This susceptible to infective, what would we make that based on, typically? To get infected, you need a how do we represent interagent interactions most commonly with state charts using begins with an M messages, yeah. So we'd have this transition based on a message, right? Um, so based on a message arrival, we can make it unconditional and they simply transition across. And we're going to need to have them spread the messages. Um, so we'd have a, a transition here. Now Darian noted uh, last time, I think it was, that actually the semantics of the transition are different depending on whether it's inside or outside. Whether it loops outside determines whether you're seen as leaving a state or not. Um, we won't uh, worry about those, um, those elements, but we'll say with a, with a rate of one, we'll send messages while in this state. And, uh, uh, this, this will be one per, per time unit, okay? Um, and uh, now to sort of complete this, how would, we, um, uh, how would we have it so that agents uh, get alerted to these, um, uh, to these messages as they arrive? Well, to do that, remember, at the level of person, we're gonna have to um, go down to uh, excuse me, to agent here, and it does say forward the message to the state chart. Okay, so that's fine. Um, the, the final thing we're going to have to do to make sure um, that some individuals stay infective is what? So some individuals will need to start infective, right? Um, so there's two ways we can do this. Previously, we had the, the environment send a message to a random infective. What I'm going to do here is going to demonstrate a separate way to do it. So if we have the state chart, call it infection state chart, um, we could have it so that a certain fraction of people start infective. How would we do that within the state chart? If we want a certain fraction to start infective, what element of the AnyLogic state chart vocabulary would we use to route people to two different states initially? Well, it's in the state chart element here. If we wanted to pick with a certain <coughs> probability they'll start infective compared to starting susceptible, how would we do that? Which of these elements would we use? Branch, yeah. Branch is, is based on a conditional, so, so we could drag this up here, um, and I don't want to, um, okay, now it, it adjusted it nicely, okay? 
So what we're going to have is a branch with one transition going here and another transition going it's going to go to in fact, whoop, that's not an initial state pointer. I don't want that. I want a transition. Here we go. Um, okay. A, no, don't land there. Okay. So I'm going to drag it over here. Um, and okay. Yeah. Um, it's, it exhibits truculence, but let me, let me double click on this, drag it around here. Um, there we go. Okay, and you'll notice with this, I'm not sure we've ever done this interactively, so I'll spend a little bit more time on this. You notice each of these, this will be the default that they go to susceptible, and they will go to infective with, let's say, a certain, a certain probability, okay? Um, so uh, here, uh, I'm tempted to create a parameter, but I think uh, in the interest of time, I'll just uh, hard code this. So um, they will go to this state under a certain condition, and that condition will be random true. So with a certain probability, it will be true, say, 1% um, start infective, okay? So random true of 0 0.01. So what do we do? We have added a state chart. Uh, here, um, the real logic is associated with these transitions. Um, that's where the action occurs. This first transition is based on a message. The second transition is based at a timeout with a timeout of 10. I added this branch. And again, the actions on the transitions. This transition here just goes to susceptible by default. This transition here, so if nothing else, no other transition is taken, it goes to susceptible. This transition occurs with a probability of 0.01, a likelihood of 0.01. Um, and this, this will occur when they are, um, uh, when they are coming, um, coming into the model. You'll notice this thing says uh, too many uh, defaults, but this is an old error message that apparently has not been updated when I uh, built it. Okay, so if I were to run this now, um, uh, well, okay, there's one other thing we need to do, sorry. Um, suppose we want to color, color them a different color when they're infective. Suppose we want to color them red. Um, one way to do that would be through a, um, through a variable. Another way, if you click on the circle to represent them and you see fill color here, one thing you could do is you could ask, are they currently infective? So you could say infection state chart. I prefer to do this with a function called is infective. So if the state chart evolved, it wouldn't be hard coded. But again, in the interest of time, I'm going to do it in this brutal way. Um, so uh, we say infection state chart dot is state active. Is state active. And we ask the, for, for the infective state. If so, then return color dot red, otherwise color dot green. Okay. Um, so what this is asking, let me let me widen that so everyone can see it. This is another way to do it. Um, like to encourage flexibility in these things. So under fill color for this circle, uh, we would like to say, okay. Infection state chart, is this state active called infective? If so, we're going to color ourselves red. Otherwise, if we're either susceptible or recovered, we'll color ourselves green. Okay? So we're only going to actually show, show those infective if they are as red. Otherwise, it'll be a single color. So then we'll run this thing. And uh, OK, no, it's, it's uh, exhibiting displeasure. OK. so. Um, Okay, so it says too many default exits. It's odd though, because it, it does say um, it has uh, it compiled successfully. So I'm a little bit confused about why it's um, why it's causing trouble. Um, okay, too many default exits. Yes. So okay. Um, so this branch. Yes. Let's let's go check that again. Okay. So by default, it goes this way. And this is based on a condition. So what's the problem? Um, okay. Okay. I don't see the problem. And this actually uh, lets it run. Okay. 
Uh, anyone want to hazard a guess what's going on here? This is this is this one's got me puzzled here, because uh, I'm I'm looking at the only transitions here. Wonder if there's a hidden transition. Um, so I'm gonna drag this away. Let's temporarily delete this guy, um, and then see if it works with just this in place, which it should. Okay, it's a happy camper now. Let me just see if it runs. Uh, yes, it runs. Okay, let's add this transition in. Or let's let's redeclare it. Okay, fine. We didn't add it back. Redeclare it. Okay, boom. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay. Let's, let's attach it there. And for this transition, I want to give it a hey. What's what's going on here? Condition this. Okay. I think no. Okay. So condition, let's try it. Let's try it uh, again. Random true 0 0.01, and compile it. <coughs> okay, but it's still saying too many default exits. Um, so I am baffled by this. Um, Dylan, any any clues here? Yeah. So um, I'm wondering if there's something residual with this uh, with this branch that's munging things up. Um, <laughs> I don't. Okay. I, well, yeah, it's it, that's a fairly heavyweight procedure. Um, so, so let me just um, flail in other ways that are lighter weight. Um, so, uh, so first, I'm gonna delete this uh, this branch. I've I've got a, a theory of a contaminated branch is my my first hypothesis. So, I'm gonna I'm gonna um, truncate the branch. I'm gonna chop lop it off, and now I'm gonna add in a new branch, fresh. Um, and I'm going to connect this to it. Boom. And then uh, I will connect these guys. I've got another theory going. Um, OK, look at that. Uh, now, nah, I think this is a thing of beauty. Um, OK, uh, so, so there we go. Um, a thing of beauty, is it not? Um, OK, so, so let's, let's go look at this branch again. Random true 0.01. Okay, and when we run this thing, uh, what we saw is basically uh, virtually everyone, in fact, everyone I see, uh, infective. Uh, I mean, sorry, uh, non-infective. Okay, so doesn't look like they are. Um, many are getting infective. Is that just a, an aspect of my um, specifying a low probability? I'm going to specify 0.5 here. And we'll see. Uh, we'll see if that if that uh, makes any difference. Ah, okay. Uh, indeed, it does. Okay, so we may have just been um, ha had a, a small number of agents. I'll make it ten percent here initially. Okay, um, and here we have uh, ten percent. Now, if, if we were to speed up, okay. Now they've they've recovered. Looks like it it wasn't. Um, uh, oh, uh, yes. No, that should have should have worked. Um, so, so I think what we saw there was a situation where we had some limited uh, spread of infection. So let's go up to the city level, okay? Um, and those agents recovered fairly quickly. Oh, of course, I forgot to do the key thing. What did I forget to do, folks? This. We didn't have this rate. We had a rate of one, but it needs to do what? Send a message. Okay. So uh, this dot send, and it could send anything. Infection. It doesn't really pay attention to what the message is, and then it sends it to random underbar connected. Um, okay. Um, so 
this guy here has to send a message for the others to receive a message to get infected. So if we, if we go run that, um, now we see the infection spreading, but it's only spreading within a city right now. Uh, if you follow the, the slides further that I'll be posting, you'll see a way to have people move between cities. Okay, so what I did is associated with this, the self-transition, this dot send, infection, comma, random connected. Okay. Um, so, so a bit of debugging there too. Um, systematically simplifying the situation to see if you could eliminate the, or you know, track down what the error was. Um, it will be eliminated under certain uh, situations, and uh, I'm, I'm still puzzled by why that why that branch gave any uh, problems. Um, but uh, replacing it certainly seems to solve the situation. So what we have now is a situation where we have uh, dynamics going on at the um, at the uh, agent level. Uh, and uh, within within each city, as I said in my in my uh, slides, I have a description of how you'd move the people between cities. So if you wanted to give an individual to move between a city, uh, we could do that. Um, let's add one other aspect of dynamics that shows kind of the possibility of mixing elements in an unexpected way, and that is if you were to go to double click on city and you were to add in a stock called um, uh, cumulative, say cumulative um, uh, tax revenue, uh, and you were to then have a flow into it of, of new tax revenue. Um, oops, oh, meant to, to add it directly there. New tax revenue. Um, new tax revenue. Um, whoops, okay, so I don't want to, let, let's drag this guy back. Um, oh, no, 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 okay. Um, I'd like to drag this guy back too. And then, yes. Okay, um, so cumulative tax revenue, and this is gonna have an initial value of zero, and then new tax revenue. And this new tax revenue might be based on something like the total income associated with the population times some tax rate. This would be a sort of regressive tax situation, a flat tax such as is advocated by certain political parties and, and, um, and jurisdictions to our south. So um, uh, if we wanted this, this tax revenue to depend on the total income across the population, how would we compute that income? Where could we compute the income? Based on what we've seen thus far in this lecture, where would be a natural place to compute the income across the population, the total income across the population? Where, where ladies and gentlemen, did we compute the, the total number of people in the population? Where did we compute the, um, the mean income in the population? Using what construct? Using what element of the any logic vocabulary did we use to compute these incomes? The door beckons, but I will not let you pass until you answer, <laughs> answer this question. Where, where, did, where did we compute the income? Where did we compute the mean income? Where did we compute the total population value? It's in population. And in what construct within city population? It's in the statistics associated with it. So all we have to do, ladies and gentlemen, is to go add a statistic, boom. And let's make it total income, okay? Total um, income across population, right? And this will be a sum up of how do we specify the income, or summing up the income for each person, how do we specify the value to retrieve for each person to be summed? Give me an expression, ladies and gentlemen. Give me an expression for how we refer to the income of each, of a given person. 
What's that? Yeah, item dot income. Yes, we saw it right there, right? Um, item dot income. We're just summing that up. True, and then we will have a under parameter. We'll have a tax tax rate, perhaps associated with this jurisdiction. Um, and so I just dragged a, a parameter there for tax rate. It'll be a double, and we will compute. Um, oops, I don't want to do a transition. I want to do a link between the tax rate on the one hand, oops, and this flow on the other. Um, and we were we are going to have a um, new tax revenue dollars per year depend on income per year times tax rate. So income per year summed up across the total population. So we computed that, ladies and gentlemen, with a statistic on the total population. Mm -hmm. So city population, population dot, and it was sum of income across population or something. What, what did I call it? I, I, the problem is it doesn't do autocomplete here. I, I called it total income across population. Okay, so this is going to be this is going to be city population dot total income across population. That's a method call. It calls that as a function. That statistic times tax rate. Okay. This is new income per year is the total income across the population for the per year times the tax rate. Mm -hmm. um, the final thing we have to do is specify value for tax rate. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in a city. Where would we specify the parameter for a city? You specify it in what? In the main, in main, because that's what creates the cities. It's particularly the population of cities in Maine. So if we go up to Maine, we go look at the population of cities, we have now a tax rate, and we could have this be drawn on a uniform population between, I don't know, between 20 and 40 percent, um, say 50 percent, so we can include Scandinavia properly. Um, and, uh, and so then we can, we can run this um, and what we will see is now we have cities, and if we go down to the city level, we will have um, we will have uh, tax revenues that did, as Shakespeare say, did the general coffers fill. So this is filling up the uh, the tax revenue associated with that city, um, and uh, you know we have we have some spread of population uh, spread of infection within within that city as well. Um, and then down at the level of, so that's some dynamics at the city level. And then down at the uh, individual level, we have individuals in various states. You'll notice that most of them are recovered because the infection is swept through. Um, meanwhile, the general coffers did fill. So here we have dynamics described in a uh, disparate way. On the one hand, at the city level, we happen to have it described with um, with stocks and flows. At the individual level, we happen to have described it with with uh, state charts. We will see next time how we can merge these sort of methods more generally. So we can have agents which have stocks and flows. We can have state charts at the global level. We can have um, we can have mixtures of uh, discrete event modeling with agents mixed in them, so that you can have agents which persist beyond the lifetime of entities within that sort of modeling we saw last time. So uh, that's all we'll uh, cover for today. But I hope that uh, helps expand your understanding of some of the ways any logic can be used a little bit more flexibly. Next time we'll we'll build on that flexibility for hybrid modeling. Okay.